Before we begin, thank you very much to TJ Omega's Secret Armada Hotshot Shrine for joining the Patreon campaign. I told you not to tell anyone about that thing. Okay, look, I don't have a Secret Hotshot Shrine. I swear I don't. I, I have a bin in the storage room full of all the hot shots, uh, so they do not hurt me anymore. That's this, that's what I have as a shrine. I have a box of shame. But thank you very much for the support. Thank you for the contribution. Um, I'm just going to throw this number out there for you because I want you to know what you have done. Today is shout-out number 200 in a row. 200 days where my intro has been shouting out someone generous enough to help keep this channel alive. And I thank each and every one of you, even if you were repeats in that 200. Thank you everyone who has made all that possible you are making the channel possible so i wanted to talk earth spark today unfortunately it was going to be an episode review set but one it wasn't happy with how the last one came out and two i didn't have access to an episode at the moment to get screenshots from so uh let's shift gears here and we'll talk about the series as a with a concept now for starters, if you have not watched EarthSpark, what are you doing? Paramount Plus is like a dirt cheap streaming service. You know, it's like, what, seven bucks for one month, something like that? Just pay the seven bucks, watch all 26 episodes. It's worth it. They're doing some incredibly good storytelling and incredibly unique storytelling. The first thing that we found out about this show's overall story that really kind of hit it off for me is the fact that it was going to be set in a situation we had never seen before. Keep in mind, we've had Transformer fiction now for almost 40 years, and this is a brand new concept. And the concept is simple. The war is over. What happens next? We're so trained to think that the war between the Autobots and Decepticons is this ongoing thing and that it never ends, but when it does end, the, fic the rare times in fiction where there is an end to the war that that's the end of the story, and it's not. It really isn't. And to explore what happens after, I think, is really fascinating and largely untouched. The only series to do it after, uh, before this, really, was, strangely enough, the Machinima series. Uh, and that led to, like, like war-worn Megatron, which was it's still one of my one of my favorite Megatrons. So I thought to myself, if we're getting something similar to that, that would be really cool. That would be really cool. So in particular, it's like, now for the Autobots, it's simple, right? Like we live peacefully. We coexist with the humans. You know, we help out the planet Earth that we've adopted, etc. But for the Decepticons, it's very different. And what Earthspark has done with its Decepticons is incredibly refreshing. And it's so different than anything we have had in the past that it immediately becomes one of my favorite aspects of the series. So I want, even if you're not watching Earthspark, I want you to give this a shot, give my video today a shot, just so you can kind of understand just how much is going into this. Now, for starters, you know, there's exceptions to the rule. We don't have to talk about the rank and file Decepticons, the types of like, uh, like Hardtop here has gotten a little bit because he has vo actual voice acting, but like Skull Cruncher and uh insecticons are mostly just there to provide obstacles right now we haven't really had a chance but we're only one season in we got plenty of room but what we did with the decepticons in season one was kind of touch on all the different ways that they could respond to the end of the war so when you talk about this uh let's just kind of let's watch let's look run through the gambit here okay i mean starting with shockwave who is the war must continue. And in his own words, the war will continue as long as I can oppose you. I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the exact quote. But there are, he is, he is the, uh, the Decepticon mindset of, no, um, this war is not over just because you declared an end to the war. Just because you, Megatron, betrayed us, I'm going to keep this war going and we are going to take over this world period. And that's what you would expect of the Decepticons, right? In any other fiction, that is what you would expect. Because we've had, like, 
the end of the war in certain fictions before, but there's always some Decepticon ready to rise up and actually like just bolster the Decepticons, rally them, and keep going. We've seen it in like the Marvel comic books, we've seen it in the IDW comic books. There's always that, right? Uh, usually that happens, so we can keep this typical story going. This time it did not. Shockwave gets shut down. So we at least find out. Yeah, like it makes sense of him, of all Decepticons, to want the war to continue. But we understand he's probably not the only one. It's just the first one we've seen so far. So there's that mindset, and it's the mindset you would expect. Then there is survival. When we talk about uh, Skywarp and Nova Scream, they've made an interesting pairing because really all they want to do is survive and they will make unsavory co you know uh, alliances in order to do that they worked for mandroid because it was better than getting captured by ghost you know at one time nova scream even mentioned uh, nova storm even mentions uh is it too late to join the autobots is it too late to be is it too late to be an autobot because really all they want to do is you know survive and not be imprisoned and they can't do that as former decepticons who fought in the war you know they're technically war criminals like even if you give them amnesty they're still decepticons and ghost is a zero tolerance to decepticons so they're they feel better on the run than anything uh and you know if it means working with mandroid to stay out of ghost clutches and you know not be you know like an autobot prisoner or dead Okay, they're willing to work with that. So there's survival instinct, where you're willing to take some really unsavory conditions if it means, you know, not being, you know, in the scrap heap. Understandable. There is the sense of betrayal. Soundwave and his cassettes really don't want the, don't, they don't seem to want to continue the war. What they're, what they do comes from a place of, just plain being hurt when they put all the like traditionally Soundwave is the most loyal of Megatron's troops outside of times where you have Lugnut of course beyond that though it's almost always Soundwave who is the most loyal you know he's the one who carries Megatron's you know, half-dead body off the battlefield in the 86 movie. He is the eyes and ears of Megatron in Transformers Prime, you know? Traditionally, Soundwave is the right-hand man. And in situations like we've seen with, like, IDW 1.0, where Megatron has turned against the Decepticons and, and tried to reform, Soundwave is hurt. He, he's, his sense of being betrayed is stronger than anyone else's in the Decepticon ranks because he gave everything that he was to Megatron and Megatron threw away his cause. So what has Soundwave given everything for now? Comes from a place of wanting revenge against Megatron. You know, that loyalty turning to hatred. And that is some of the most bitter hatred there is. You know, where, you know, where something came from a place of admiration, loyalty, love, you know, depending on whatever the story or context is. In this case, yeah, it's purely loyalty and a pure belief in the Decepticon cause that he is now betrayed. You know, so in, in a way, to psychoanalyze Soundwave, he's almost the most hurt in all this situation. And you could almost feel bad for him because, really, he just wanted to follow his leader and his leader betrayed him. So I can kind of see where he's coming from when we talk about Soundwave. There's probably other Decepticons that feel the same way, too. How about we get into some of the more interesting cases? Tarantulas is such a fascinating depiction here. All he wants to do is live normally. And he can't do that because there's no Cybertron to live normally on. So his only option is to live amongst the humans. But he can't do that because he is a Decepticon. More than that, he is a Decepticon that cannot hide amongst humanity because he does not have a vehicle alt mode. He's a big, he's a big monster spider. His whole story arc, his whole plan is to live amongst the humans with hollow technology. 
And that's interesting. He just wants to be able to live. He wants to be able to go out and enjoy the world itself. He doesn't want conquest. He doesn't want to seize power. He doesn't want revenge on the humans or Autobots. And he doesn't really want, uh, you know, any traditional Decepticon goal. He wants to be left alone and he just wants to enjoy life. He doesn't get to do that because he's still on the run. This is a really sympathetic version of Tarantulas, you know? Um, he, what he wants is something that's very untypical of a Decepticon. You know, and coming from a place of, like, after the war, he is one that feels like he fell into the Decepticons mostly because of what he was, not because he believed in what they were. So he's not really a villain at any point. The only time he's antagonistic is because of a misunderstanding that's pretty quickly resolved. It's a really interesting depiction for Tarantulas. And I can see why they picked him, because his technological know-how is part, you know, is required for the story. His beast mode sets him apart and makes sense for why he's actually uh, doing what he's doing. Uh, it, I mean, it works. It's interesting. Also, it's Nick Roche doing the design work, and Nick Roche has already shown Tarantulas a great amount of love. But again, it's a very different depiction for a Decepticon and a very different motivation. You know, it's fascinating to me. It really does present like shades of gray amongst Decepticons. We're not just all evil Decepticons like the trademark and on the toy box wants you to believe, but like they're just people. They have their own motives for why they were Decepticons. And now that the war is gone, those motives shift, right? Take the instance of Breakdown. Breakdown is friends with Bumblebee, like friendly rival with Bumblebee. But, you know, when, you know, when Breakdown basically like, you know, essentially sacrifices himself so Bumblebee can get away, he shows an actual level of care for an Autobot, an Autobot he fought against in the war. You know, and that is comes from a place of respect. Does it come from a place of friendship? It's kind of hard to tell because they are very chummy but they're also very competitive with each other. And really what Breakdown seems to want to do is just hide amongst the humans and just have fun racing them. Uh, he's basically just, he, he's basically like, he's basically just retired after the war and all he wants to do all day is joyride, except instead of buying that really super fancy uh, convertible or Corvette, he is the fancy car. So he doesn't need to do any of that. And he's just kind of chill. He's just kind of chill. He doesn't have any plan. His plan is just like, I want to race today. That's it. That's his plan. Oh, breakdown. I hope we see more of in season two, uh, because like I, I'm interested to see why he is. Well, I mean, obviously he all he he should, he enjoys his freedom. And again, he's a Decepticon. You know, so ultimately, Ghost is not going to give him a chance like they did Megatron. Megatron is just a, a useful asset. So I think that's the only reason why he is the exception to Ghost. But really, Breakdown, again, just like Tarantulas, doesn't really want to cause humans any problems. He doesn't want to conquer the world. He just kind of wants to live. And I think that's an interesting take. Now, it's not to say every Decepticon out there isn't, you know, is like some, like, super deep character or anything like that or some interesting switch up swindle is very much swindle uh and i think that's appropriate i think swindle always just kind of being his scheming self i don't think it would have been right to depict him any other way but he is just kind of in it for himself um uh, it's not about getting the decepticons back together it's not about vengeance on humans he's kind of just looking to cause his own chaos and he's looking to, you know, for a little bit of personal profit in, in, in the process, which again, typical Swindle. But because Swindle is traditionally an extremely selfish Decepticon to the point where he'll even sell the scrap parts of his teammates, uh, I do think it makes sense that he is the one who's just kind of on his own doing whatever he wants, right? That just kind of works for him. So you have that. I'm sure there, I'm sure in season two, we're going to meet a lot of other Decepticons like that who are just kind of in it for themselves and just, you know, uh, causing chaos and still generally being a bad guy. They're just not like a take over the world bad guy or more like a petty criminal bad guy, um, which happens. 
which kind of happens, you know, like, like, you know, it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's the veteran that can't get the war mindset out, and so he, like, goes rogue or something, um, it happens, you know, so, like, there's, there's something very real about his depiction, too, I mean, obviously, the biggest one is going to be Megatron, again, with Nick Roche helming, you know, you know, helping out with all the character designs and all that, Obviously, there's some input because he does feel very much IDW 1.0 Megatron. It does carry in those footsteps of Megatron originally fought this war for freedom and equality, but gets goes too far. And when he realizes he goes too far, he wants to backpedal and get back to what he originally wanted, which you know ultimately was peace. But it was peace from a but it was peace from a type of Autobot that doesn't exist anymore. And the realization that Optimus Prime really isn't someone that he would have started this war with. It's you know, Prime is someone who actually would have uh, given the Decepticons the, you know, the consideration that Megatron wanted them to have to begin with. So we do have the Autobot Megatron thing again. All right. So and I like the Autobot Megatron thing. Uh, I think it worked really well in uh, in IDW 1.0. I think it works well in Earthspark because it gives us a very different perspective on what's going on on Earth uh, and how uh, you know the Decepticons have adapted to it, and it gives us some insight into you know how the Decepticons operated. Well, you know, it's fascinating, and again, it's different. You know, keep in mind, even in IDW 1.0, we really didn't get to see Optimus and Megatron working together uh, for the good of all Transformers because Megatron gets banished to the Lost Light. He has to follow around Rodimus and his crew. So, you know, Optimus and Megatron had very little time together when they were on the same side. This time we actually get to see it, and it's a fascinating depiction to see how two arch enemies actually work together for a change. It's fun. And then we get to the most recent. And I will give kind of a, a bit of a spoiler warning because this is from the most recent batch of episodes. Uh, but I do think it is significant. I do think it is worth talking about. We got to see what Starscream in this series is like. And it's unlike any Starscream we've had before. So there is traits. I mean, they openly mention it in the show that there are traits to Starscream that are very traditional, that he is very selfish, he does think for himself, he's very quick to abandon his comrades as soon as he has an excuse if it means saving his own shell. That said, there's the two aspects of this Starscream that are fascinating. The first one is the fact that he does become attached to Hashtag. They actually find a little bit of common ground, not only because something about the naivety of Hashtag as a newborn Cybertronian, Let's her see Starscream in a fresh light, unfazed by his past history, because she has no history with him. So when he says, you know, so when Starscream talks, you know, about how much Megatron hurt him, Hashtag believes him, and he's shocked that someone would actually listen to him, and listen to what he needs to get off his chest beyond just the usual pandering and ego. It's a very different thing, and it actually gives him some concern for Hashtag. He actually actively tries to save Hashtag. And I think it's an interesting concept that in this series, the Decepticons are continually caught off guard by the Terrans, both in their own abilities, but also in their own feelings toward them. Because keep in mind, they're a completely different type of Cybertronian. They're technically not even Cybertronian. Um... Because of that, the prejudice doesn't exist. Like, there's no, like, hatred after the war. There's no, you know, nothing competitive. They kind of see them in a fresh light, you know? So they don't really harbor any grudge against them. So they interact with them in different ways. We saw it with, you know, Tarantulas. And we see it again with Starscream and Hashtag. And the other part of that is something that I mentioned in that, in that is we actually talk about how Megatron treats Starscream. And we've seen from the original series, it's incredibly abusive. If you look at any past depictions of Starscream and Megatron's relationship, 
It is very, very abusive. Megatron uses brute force and violence to keep Starscream in line. And amongst the villains, yeah, that's to be expected. But when you just kind of like take the villainy away and just understand just like how toxic and abusive it is, now you realize there might actually be some psychological trauma to Starscream that no one has ever explored before because he fell in the rank of file of someone who would rather beat the obedience into him rather than earning it. So yeah, there's actual trauma to this Starscream. And his hatred for Megatron doesn't come from a place of uh, you know, it doesn't come from a place of, like, I want leadership for myself, which is traditional G1. It doesn't come from a place from, I hate who you are as a person, where you, where Armada Starscream turned to the Autobots. But in this, to, in this one, no, it's more along the lines of, you're my abuser, and I'm not going to side with you. You know, the last thing he says to him, you know, where it's, when Megatron asks... Uh, you know, if they would, if Starscream would come with them, like, what if you could go somewhere safe? And Starscream's response is, nowhere is safe with you. That tells you everything you know just about how much this Starscream is hurt by Megatron, emotionally as much as physically. It's a very different depiction. It's a fascinating depiction. And it's one I really want to see explored in season two. Uh, because Starscream got out kind of late in season one, we only got a little bit of it, uh, only a little bit. And when he does come to help save the day at the end, uh, in the finale two parter, again, you realize there's actually some layers of gray to this Starscream. There's actually something more to him besides being selfish and power hungry. He's actually capable of acting like a person. So it's kind of incredible. It's incredible and it's unique and I want to see more of it. And I'm hoping season two brings out more of these kind of Decepticons because there's so many different ways they could respond to the end of the war. This is just a broad spectrum of what we've seen so far and there's more out there. It's just up to the writers to depict it and I'm kind of excited for it because it's really fascinating storytelling and something very different than we've ever had in the past. So that's me gushing about how much I like this series. I've made no bones about that before, but in particular, the Decepticons are so different. I mean, I, I just, I have to talk it. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for listening to me gush. Um, hopefully you enjoy these Decepticons as well, because I genuinely think from a storyline standpoint, they're the most varied and interesting ones we have gotten in a long, long time, especially in a cartoon. So let me know what you thought, and I will see you next time. I'm like, I think you guys got this. I will back away, and I will see you all later. You've got this handled. <laughs> and he's like, really? You're not going to help me? Like, it's fine now. It's like, these disgusting <laughs> creatures breathing down my neck, and you're all just like, I believe in you. You got this. That all burn. right, you seem he's... to have this. Five minutes. <laughs> <laughs>